Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before you asking for your special anointing, Lord. We need your Holy Spirit here, Lord, to do the work in our hearts that we desperately need. Please, God, honor our request as we know you will because you love us so much. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. The title of this, I don't really like to call it sermons because I'm not a preacher, I'm a teacher. But the title of this is just taking care of business. How many of you feel like sometimes we're just in the business of taking care of business? And this is on. I think we had trouble with this last time I was here. Hmm. I'll turn it off and turn it on again. Yeah. I didn't hit the, I'm hitting the, there we go. Okay. I want to share with you a little story about a man named J.L. Turner. He was actually the founder of what we know as Dollar General. Years ago, back in the 30s, when things were very, it was right before the Depression had started, um, this man became his own self-made entrepreneur. He had an idea in mind that he wanted to be able to provide things for people at a cost that they could afford. And in those days, the economy was already iffy and a little weak. And so he had to really come up with something wonderful. So he saw opportunities. And when he saw people's businesses starting to suffer, he went in and bought everything that they had, all of their supplies and goods. And he sold them wholesale. And he soon developed a real stronghold in this area. And his son decided to join with him. And after the Depression, they actually each put in $5,000 and bought up everything they could come up with and started what we know as Dollar General. And back in the day, it was making about $30,000 a year. It's now more than $36 billion a year. That's a lot of money, right? The reason it's been such a success is not only did they see a need and fulfill it, but they built it on two good old American dream concepts, hard work and customer service. Where did that go, right? You know, I have come to the point in my life when someone is kind to me in the line, you know, your cashier, or the lady at the drive through or whatever, I'm just so grateful. I probably sound a little gushy, you know? Oh, thank you. You have a good day, too, because it's rare. It's so rare in this world. People are so busy in their mind, and they're so stressed, and they're, they're so discouraged, and, and they're, frankly, they're tired. Now, I heard a sermon a few weeks ago by a man named, a pastor actually named Stephen Furtick. He's not an Adventist, but I'm telling you, guess what? Adventists aren't the only ones who love the Lord. He loves the Lord, and he does some amazing messages, messages that really hit home. And this, this sermon, he said he was talking to people before COVID, and he asked them, how are you doing? And you know what they would say? I'm busy, or I'm tired. Isn't that just about the reply you get from everybody, right? And then COVID hits, and a lot of people are shut in. Some people are working from home. And like for me, I had the commute part went away because I do a lot of driving all over the state and, and to work and stuff. That part went away, but all the other anxieties of everyone else's businesses came my way. So it didn't relax at all for me. But I know for some people, like I know a lady that works in an optometry office, and they, uh, you know, their doors were pretty much shut. They were only seeing patients on a, an emergency basis. And so she was getting paid for a whole week, and yet she only worked a half a day a week. So some people, you know, it was a wonderful thing. But yet, if you still ask those people who were kind of blessed a little bit by the opportunity to be shut in, how they're doing, you know what they still said to him? I'm tired. 
You are so smart. I'm tired. How is it they're so tired when they're no longer that busy? How is it that they're feeling so down and, and you know, like exhausted, right? A survey said that 43% of Americans admit they're too tired to even function properly at work. Now, I hesitate to ask you, though, what kind of tired are we talking about here? Are we, talk about, are we talking about physical tiredness? Because that's curable, that's fixable, right? Go to bed, get some sleep, shut the TV off, right? Or shut the social media or the internet or whatever it is. Have some good nutrition, take a walk. We all know the, the creation guidelines, right? That's not the kind of tired I think people are talking about. I think they're talking about this tired. That symbolizes something, doesn't it? It's more than tired. It's weary. How many of you feel weary sometimes? We're tired of being tired. We're even discouraged. We're even depressed. It's a sad world. But yet Jesus says, what? Come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. What an invitation. I want you to think with me back to the life of Jesus. When he was born, he was dedicated in the temple. And Anna and Simeon came. And they were blessed by his presence. Why? Because they recognized something special about that baby, didn't they? Every baby's beautiful. Every baby glows. Every mother glows, right? Every new mom just, you know, they're just radiant. But this baby was special. This baby had a presence. And Anna and Simeon were one of the few to recognize that. And this is where I'm uh, not going to be able to see that far away, so I have my screen up here. To Simeon and Anna had been given the promise that he should, or to Simeon had been given the promise that he should not die until he'd seen the Savior. As soon as he saw Jesus in the temple, he knew that baby was the promised one. Upon the face of Jesus, there was a soft, heavenly light. And Simeon, taking the child in his arms, praised God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. That was an astounding realization. But as we know, spiritual things are what? spiritually discerned. They were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for this special baby. And as soon as they saw that baby, they were free to die. They didn't care anymore. They had accomplished what they had come to do, and that was to see the face of Jesus. So now, as Jesus is a child, and he's growing, the child grew, and he waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So this child being raised by loving parents, we all know the story, the miraculous Christmas birth, raised by two parents who loved God and wanted to follow what God had told them in message from, from an angel, right? They knew this was a special baby. They knew this was a special child, and they reared him to be so. But what was that grace that was upon him? In Zechariah 12.10, the prophet said, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. What is that spirit of grace? That divine grace it has been defined as the divine influence which operates in humans to regenerate and sanctify, to inspire virtuous impulses, and to impart strength to endure trial and resist temptation. 
Is that the kind of weariness we're feeling now? Are we being tempted to feel discouraged and depressed, anxious and alone, isolated, fearful? I feel like our country is operating on fear right now, don't you? We have been so (laughs) embalmed with this fear notion that people are starting to not even think for themselves. But friends, I'm not talking about whether or not to wear a mask. I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about recognizing where God is working. He is alive and he is working. Jesus said, his mom scolded him then in the temple, right? He was taken to the temple and to be uh, dedicated. And when he was talking with the priests and scribes, was lost track of, you know the story, and mom comes back and dad, and they said, where have you been? Why did you do this to us? And he said, oh, but don't you know, I'm to be about my father's business. That's the point when Jesus started to understand what his true purpose was, right? So up until now, some people recognize the spirit in him. Now he's recognizing the spirit working within him, right? As Jesus in the temple solved the mysteries which priests and rulers had not discerned, so in the closing work of this earth, children who have been rightly educated will in their simplicity speak words which will be an astonishment to men who now talk of higher education. I took a class this summer, an administrative class, and in it were a lot of young people, behavioral psychologists, school psychologists, teachers and principals, all kinds of people. And I am telling you, there's hope, people. There's hope. These young people are being imbued with the Holy Spirit. They are, I could not believe the wisdom that they shared. And, And I understand the Bible says, you know, having gray hair is a, is a crown of glory, right? It means we've been through a lot. It means we've seen a few things, right? It means we, are, we have some imparted wisdom. We've learned some things. We've had some experiences. But I'm telling you that God is on a fast track right now, and he's taking these young people. They don't have to go through all the stuff you and I did to get to where we're at. Some of them are already there and beyond because of the work of the Holy Spirit. I just sit back and go, wow, wow, when I listen to this. And if you could spend a day at Cochise SDA and you could sense this in these young people, you could hear the Holy Spirit working in their hearts and their lives, you would be amazed. People were amazed. And then we have the point when Jesus was baptized, right? The Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. So now, you know, remember that before, when he was born, a few recognized the Spirit, right? And then when he went to the temple, he understood that he had the Spirit, the work of the Spirit. But now, in public baptism, everyone sees the Holy Spirit at work. And this is the point. When Jesus laid down his hammer and his saw, his work of carpentry, and began his work of ministry, preaching and teaching and healing, our young people today are choosing the baptism of the Holy Spirit at even younger ages because they recognize that God is calling them to begin the work and to begin the journey now, not to wait. And I praise God for that. I was witness to a couple of baptisms last weekend. Three young people in Colorado were baptized because they understand the working power of the Holy Spirit. And it is the Holy Spirit that will keep us 
from becoming weary. We are going to get tired. That's inevitable. There's a lot to do in a day. And even as I grow older, I feel like I tire more easily. So I understand that that's not going to get any better, right, until Jesus comes. But it does not mean that I have to give up. It does not mean that the work of the Holy Spirit cannot do its work still. The Spirit is alive and working. And many times in the Bible we're reminded of this. Three times we're reminded not to grow weary of doing good, not to grow tired. We'll grow tired. Maybe our church is performing some service some missions. Maybe there's things that need to be done. Maybe the school needs help. Maybe Susan is asking for extra this or extra that. We're going to get tired, but we're not having to get weary, to grow weary. The Lord says, let us not grow weary, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. We do not want to lose heart. I want to share with you something that I received from a teacher, um, not at the school, though Susan has many wonderful stories, but this mother texted the teacher at one of my other schools, one of our other schools, and she had taken her children out of the school last year and put them in another Christian school because she felt like the school, because it was small, could not possibly be doing all this great work, right? Listen to what she texted. Hi, call me when you are free. I just wanted to share that her daughter got moved to honors math yesterday and English because they are hand in hand. She is also the theology teacher's go-to student when no one else has an answer. Thank you so much. I was wrong about our academic concerns for all three children, please forgive me. Also, so-and-so's teacher, one of her sons, sent me this today. So-and-so is doing great in second grade so far. She's reading above grade level and is always willing to participate in class. At this time, I have no academic or behavioral concerns for so-and-so, so I do not feel that we need to have a conference. However, if you have any questions or would like to meet, please let me know. And also, the other child is also ahead in math and seems to breeze through his classes. He gets it when others don't. I don't know, but your school is producing some amazing set-apart children for the Lord. That, my friends, is why we have Adventist education. I don't care how big or small the school is. I don't care what the facility is, as long as the Holy Spirit is there working through our teachers who do provide great hard work and great customer service, as long as they continue to work hard and provide that service in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit, this is what's changing lives. You see, we're going to try to do service without God, and we're going to get weary and tired. But with him, we're just going to get tired. We can handle tired, right? We can do that. Ty Gibson, a well-known evangelist and book writer, said this about the power of the Holy Spirit. The end time outpouring of the Holy Spirit will not come to us as a nebulous or mysterious power, but rather in the form of of unprecedented clarity regarding God's love, which was put on display in Jesus. In other words, the Holy Spirit operates with one very specific goal, and that goal is to direct mental and emotional attention to the good news of God's saving grace as manifested in the sacrifice of Christ. Once we understand this, we can know with certainty when we are accounting the activity of the Holy Spirit in God's church and when we're not. Friends, I know that in, through the, how, the power of the Holy Spirit, our schools can continue to grow Christians 
who are going to help us finish this end work. And if you're looking for your child to grow up and be of age before they start to impact people's lives, think again. The Holy Spirit is transforming our young people now. But the question is, is it transforming us? Are we allowing the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Are we being raised up on wings like eagles so that we can run and not grow weary? We cannot do it. I cannot do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm tired of being tired, aren't you? I praise God today for the wonderful work that he's doing and for Susan and Arnie and Teresa and Julie B and all the and Jim and all Susan, all the people who are just nonstop. And I won't say tirelessly cuz that's not true, right? They are tired. Everybody's tired, but wearylessly contributing to the school to make it a wonderful place for our students to grow and to learn. But my invitation to you today is to allow the Spirit to keep you from growing weary. So if you're weary today, lay it at the, lay it at the altar and let the Holy Spirit do the work. <laughs>